righty. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church today. I want to welcome all those joining us live right now online. Thanks for joining us, guys. Hey, wasn't that a great time of worship, everybody? Just declaring that, uh, man, fear does not have a chance when we're standing in the love of Jesus. Amen to that? Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, um, I want to remind everybody that pre-ordered a Cornerstone Chapel pullover. If you did, uh, those are in today. You can pick those up out in the foyer after church. Let's get ready for the message today. On the back of your bulletin is an outline that we're going to be following today. Um, you can grab your Bibles. You can pull up everything on the Version Bible app if you have that downloaded on your device. We have all the notes and scriptures for you there. And I just want to say happy February to everybody, guys. Happy February, man. We're already in the second month of the year. And um, with that said, the first weekend in this month is Super Bowl Sunday. So I wanted to take a little survey today about Super Bowl Sunday. Just I'm going to ask you three questions. I think pretty much everyone would fall into one of these categories, pretty much. But uh, the first question is, how many of you are here today and you have like zero interest? You are like not even watching. I could care less. Raise your hand. That's you. Come on. Okay, some of you. All right. How many of you are on um, kind of the other extreme? Like, dude, I can't wait till tonight. I am turning on. I'm watching this game. All right. How many of you are right in the middle? You're like, oh, I might channel surf a little bit. Ah, okay. All right. Cool. All right. Well, uh, I, I figured most of you would fall into one of those. Um, and with that said, I wanted to start off with a football joke, okay? So, in honor of Super Bowl Sunday, listen to this. Looking down the stairs at an NFL football game, a fan spots an open seat on the 50-yard line front row. Sneaking past the usher, he asks the man sitting next to the open seat if the seat is taken. No, he replies. I used to take my wife to all the games, but now that she's passed away, I'm just here all alone. Well, why don't you invite a friend to join you? Well, I can't, because all my friends are at her funeral. <laughs> okay, so that's way too serious, hardcore football fan. fan. All you guys that raise your hands on that one question, don't go that far, okay? Don't go that far, all right. Well, hey guys, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. We're kicking off a new series today. Woohoo! Expedition through Ephesians. We are in week one of going through this New Testament book. Um, it's going to be a nine week series on Sunday mornings. And, and on top of that, it is our spring church wide, what we call discipleship experience, where not only are we going to be going through the book of Ephesians for the next nine weeks on Sundays, but many of you, really the majority of our church, um, is in an Ephesians small group. Uh, we had several small groups this spring, which we're so thankful for, and um, many of them are Ephesians. And so um, we're so, you know, just glad that we can go through this together as a church. You know, we started doing this a couple years ago in 2018, where our whole church went through what we called Rooted, and we'd preach on Sunday, then our, all our small groups were going through that. And then we're like, this is cool, man, uh, that our church can go through something together and be on the same page and growing and learning together and be in unity. So we did it again in 2019. We went through the Old Testament book of Joshua. And, and we just, like, sensed the Lord, like, let's do it again. So we're going through this New Testament book of Ephesians. Um, this spring. It's going to be great. And um, our youth ministry, our teens are going to be going through Ephesians as well. So, man, we really feel like our church is just going on this together. And, um, you know, I wanted to point out that if you are in one of the Ephesians small groups, that um, we are going to be going through what we're calling the participants guide. And um, what this is, is just, you know, what we're talking about um, on Sundays, uh, we kind of go a little more throughout the week. And um, so each, each week has kind of some uh, a time where you can do a little uh, digging and reading and studying and, and uh, answer some questions. And then your small groups can get together and, and talk it through. And we just believe as we do that, we're just going to be growing. And, and uh, man, we're just going to be going through this book, every chapter. There's six chapters and we're just going to be pulling it apart. And as I was praying about how to break this book up. Here's, here's what we're going to, be, going to be doing the next nine weeks. Check this out. Ephesians chapter one, who we are and who God is. 
Ephesians 2, understanding the gospel. Ephesians 3, knowing God's love. Ephesians 4 is called and equipped to serve and experiencing freedom. Um, Ephesians chapter 5 is Christ-like character and relationships. And Ephesians chapter 6 is the armor of God and people of prayer. Come on, does that that just sound like a good time, right? And so um, you can still get into an Ephesians group if you'd like. Um, Stop by our small group table out there and pick up your book. Um, And if you can't be in an Ephesians group, Man, I just want to encourage you, get in, get in any small group because it's so important to, to just come on Sundays and be a part of what's going on here in the weekends, but be connected in a small group. Sound good, everybody? Well, as we kick off this series today, we are going through this New Testament book, really, chapter by chapter. I really feel like the Lord gave me this verse in 1 Timothy, which... Paul wrote, and Paul's the same one that wrote Ephesians, and he was talking to his young disciple, Timothy, and he he said something to him, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this this just so resonates with me of what we're going to be doing these next nine weeks. Um, and And he said this in 1 Timothy 4, he says, Paul says, hey, until I come to you in person, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. And I just really feel like, man, that's what we're going to be doing on Sunday, We are simply, we don't want to complicate this. We just want to simply open our Bibles and read this this book of Ephesians and let the Holy Spirit talk to us and minister to us and grow us and encourage us. And then it goes on to say, and watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. And I, I just really feel like, That's where small groups come in because that's where we hear this message on Sunday and we're encouraged, but then we get together with others and we can sharpen one another and build one another up and encourage one another in this this journey of faith that we're on. So today we're kicking it off, man. Ephesians chapter 1, week 1. And we're talking about who we are and who God is. Like if you would literally open your Bible, you would see that Ephesians chapter 1 Um, is broken down into three parts. Verse 1 and 2, it's it's all about who Paul is, because Paul is introducing himself as the author. And then right in the middle, um, there's this passage of Scripture that Paul is, you know, talking to, you know, the the, the people of Ephesus, um, who they are in Jesus. And Paul's just sharing his story, like what he has learned, and he wants to share it with them. And then the last part of Ephesians chapter 1 is all about um, Paul's writing about who God is. And so that's how this message is going to break down today. So let's just jump into this. Um, Ephesians 1 verses 1 and 2 is talking about who Paul was. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus. Now, if you're, if you're new to scripture and you're looking at this book called Ephesians, what that means is it's to the Christians that lived in the city of Ephesus. So they just called them Ephesians. and They were the faithful in Christ Jesus. And Paul just says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, we want to know that this book was written by the apostle Paul And we need to know that the Apostle Paul, um, you know, when in his earlier days, he was against God. He was one that was against Christians, against the church. He he was a persecutor of anybody that followed Christ. I mean, he was brutal. He was mean. um, And he would just be searching for Christians so he could persecute them because they followed Christ. Christ. So he was radical, but then one day he gets radically saved, or he just radically turns his life to Christ. And that's an amazing story in Acts chapter 9, and where if you read that, you know, Jesus just shows up to him, and he goes from a radical enemy of God to a radical follower of God. And it's just amazing what happens just overnight, just his life is changed. But with that, you know, as he began to follow Christ, he began to get persecuted. And to the, to the point of, he was actually, in his later days, he was actually thrown in prison. So what he does in prison, he wants to make the most of his faith. So 
you know, Paul wrote a lot of books in the Bible, but during his time in prison, he actually writes four New Testament books, and some people call them the prison epistles, and they are these, Ephesians, which we're going through, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Now, those first three are churches that Paul was instrumental in planting. He, he started these churches in, this, in these cities. And that last one, Philemon, that was just one of his friends, like a disciple, another disciple of Christ, that he was writing letters to encourage them. And, but, but since we're going through Ephesians, if you look at this book, it's only six chapters. But oh my gosh, it's such a, an amazing book because if you look, the first three chapters of Ephesians are what we call, they're more doctrinal. Um, and all that means, doctrinal means, it, Paul is writing to the believers in Ephesus, and now we get to apply it to our lives today, but, he, but he's trying to teach us to know what we believe, to, to really be, be confident in what, what we believe. And then the last three chapters are more practical, like how do we do this? How do we live out our faith? How do we take what we believe and live it out? And so I love on page six of the Ephesians Participants Guide, which many of you have already, but I, I love how um, Deb, when she was writing this, she included this, this quote, and it says, before God calls the church to war, which many of you know, Ephesians chapter six is all about the armor of God and fighting the fight of faith. And this quote says, before God calls the church to war, he teaches us how to walk. Isn't that good? And before he teaches us how to walk, he teaches us how to stand. Isn't that good? And, and that's what Ephesians is all about. He starts with what we need to know, what we need to believe, and then how we walk it out. So that's all about the author, the Apostle Paul. Let's jump into this next portion of Scripture, which really we're going to spend most of our time on today. And it's verses 3 through 14. And I'm entitling this portion, Who I Am. Paul is now writing to the believers in Ephesus. And what he's doing, he's sharing, he's, he's so excited to share with these believers what he has learned when he went from a radical persecutor to a radical follower of God. God, through the Holy Spirit, taught him a brand new identity in Jesus Christ. Paul had to learn who he was now, this new creation in Christ Jesus. And some of you, this doesn't matter, but some of you like to know these little kind of tidbit facts about the Bible. Let me give you one right here. Um, if you're looking at chapter 1 right now and you look at verses 3 through 14, you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of grammar and punctuation, periods, commas, colons, semicolons. Listen to this. Um, no matter how your English Bible has translated it, in the original language, verses 3 through 14 was all one big sentence that Paul wrote. Can you believe that? That's a long sentence, isn't it? Here, listen to this. You know why? The brother was excited about what he was telling us. And I'm telling you, like I said, that tidbit might not mean much, but it means a lot to me because we need to know this was just like, like he started to write who God was teaching Paul who he was. And he was just on a roll. He was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm this in Christ and I'm this in Christ. Dip more pen and ink. And I'm this in Christ and this in Christ. Dip more pen in the ink, blah, 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 blah. And he's, can you imagine the smoke just coming off his pen? Because he's so excited, man, about what he's learning like back in the day, he couldn't just type it out like we can. But listen, you know why I think it was all one big sentence? He was just oh, so passionate about who he was in Christ. And you know what my prayer is for you guys today, for us, is that we leave today just a little more passionate, just a little more excited about who we really are in Jesus. Okay? So let's read this today. Let's jump into it. I'm going to ask you a little crowd participation throughout this, okay? But come on, let's read it together. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us, say these next two words, in him, remember that, 
before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption, remember that one, to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Say these next two words. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all the things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Say it. In him, good job, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, When you believed, you were marked in him. Good job. I didn't even have to ask you that time. With a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Wow. Is that awesome or what? Now does that mean a little more to you now that there was not one period? That was one big sentence that Paul wrote. Because the Holy Spirit was just just coming upon him, just teaching him and showing him radical persecutor, the radical follower, and who he was now in Christ. Can you imagine some of the thoughts that Paul used to be bombarded with when he was following Christ? How Satan probably was whispering in his ear, you're a sorry Christian. You remember what you did in the past? You, you remember your past? Blah, 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 blah. Just kind of trying to get him down. Paul needed to know who he was in Jesus. Amen? And I'm telling you, he was so excited to share it to the church of Ephesus, and now we get to learn from it too. And I think it's so important. Here's why, guys. Check this out. I think many times in living life, in the stuff that we go through, I think the enemy is always bombarding us to try to get us to fill in this blank with with lies. I am, mm, like, how many times, like, are we thinking and our thoughts go there and we, we rehearse over and over things that really were a part of our past or things the enemy is trying to get us to believe. And we don't have one of these, you know, physically or literally, but I had this, I had this picture in my heart this week when I was preparing this that I think sometimes, I think somewhere in our heart, okay, that there's a filing cabinet, okay, that sometimes instead of believing the truth about who I am, I think sometimes I go to this old dusty filing cabinet in my heart and I start rehearsing over and over things like this. You know what? Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. I am, I am stupid. Or maybe it's this one. I am worthless. Yep, when that person confronted me today, I, I'm, I'm driving home and that's all I'm thinking about. It's all I'm thinking about. When that teacher made that negative comment to me, now I think, you know, it's all I'm thinking about. How about this one? I am a failure. Yep, I just, I, 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 didn't, I didn't do that thing right that I was asked to do and I just, I'm a failure. I can't do ever, anything right. And how about this one? I am unwanted. I am unwanted. I just don't belong. I just, you know, I'm not connected. I just, now, do you know these four things that I just held up were real, literal lies from our pastoral staff that we struggle with? The four of us on pastoral staff. And I can imagine if these are real life things that, that we struggle with, um, how many of you know, I, I, think, I think we can all relate to this, can't we? Now, maybe I didn't hold up the one you struggle with, but what is that 
thing, that lie that sometimes you, you, you tend to just go back to you, you just, I am yeah, this, I'm this. Church, that's why it's so important that we get this message that's in Ephesians chapter 1 about what Paul's trying to teach us of, of who we are in Christ. So when that does happen, that we can say, no, 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 no. Thank you, Lord, that in you I am, and then fill in the blank with things that are true. Amen? It's like I love this story I wanted to share um, out of this book. Man, I've had this book forever back in my youth pastor days. But it's called Stomping Out the Darkness by Neil Anderson. Now, Neil Anderson's ministry, his writings, he is one of those guys, he's, he, he's a teacher of our identity in Christ. He's written many things about it. And I remember chapter one of this book, it's entitled, Who Are You? And he starts off his book by saying this, on the first day of school, you go into class and your teacher says, who are you? And you answer confidently, well, I'm Chris. Wrong, she replies. That's your name. Oh, my gosh. Well, who are you? Well, I'm the student body president. Wrong again. That's what you do. Um, I'm an American. No, that's where you live. Um, I'm Baptist. No, that's where you go to church. You may continue on and on trying to answer the questions. I'm the quarterback on the football team. I'm the homecoming queen. I'm the president of the chess club. <laughs> but that's not who you are. Suppose you are seriously injured in a car accident and lose much of your physical ability or your beauty or your mental capacity. Would you still be you? Of course you would. There's much more to you than what you look like and what you do. Remember Dave Dravecki? Some of you in my generation will remember that name. He was a Major League Baseball pitcher. It says, remember Dave Dravecki, the former pitcher for the San Francisco Giants? In October of 1988, he underwent surgery for cancer on his pitching arm. The doctors thought he would never play professional baseball again. But Dave Dravecki had the heart of a lion. And on August 10th, 1989, he returned to the mound and he won an unbelievable victory for his team. But tragically, in the next game, just five days later, his arm broke again while pitching. This time, the doctors could not save it. And on June 17th of 1990, Dravecki checked into the hospital to have his arm and shoulder amputated. How important was Dave Dravecki's pitching arm to him? He writes, quote, My arm was to me what hands are to a piano player, what legs are to a ballerina, what feet are to a marathon runner. I was what the people cheered me for, what they paid their money to see. It is what made me valuable, what gave me worth, at least in the eyes of the world, then suddenly my arm was gone, end quote. Was Dave Dravecki's life over because he lost his arm? No. It has been radically changed, but he is still Dave Dravecki, a child of God. He realized that who he is goes far beyond his ability to throw a baseball. Isn't that true? How many times do we base our identity in things that can change out of our control? right? And many times we put all, all our weight on those things and then something happens and that changes. And because we put and based our identity on things that can change, when they do change, then our identity goes down the drain instead of basing our identity on what can never, ever change. And that's what, who God says about us. Amen? That's what Ephesians 1 is all about, who we really are because of who God is really is. And so I want to show you an illustration about what this means. And before I do, I want to give you the big idea for the day, and it's this. Write this down in your notes if you are taking notes. Listen to this. My I am is found in the in hymns. Isn't that good? My I am or who I am is found in the in hymns or who God is, who God says about me. Now, you remember when we were reading through the scripture and I asked you guys to say the phrase, in him? The reason I did that is to let that sink into our hearts. 
And here's another one of those little tidbit things that some of you might appreciate. But the Apostle Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. That's a lot, isn't it? 13 books in the New Testament. And check this out. This phrase, in him, it's said over 160 times in those 13 books. If you do the math, if you take 160, divide that by the 13 books, it averages about 12 in hymns per book. Except for this. In the book of Ephesians, there's 36 of them. 36 times it says in him. Uh, do you think God is trying to teach us something as we go through the book of Ephesians? That, that we need to understand that my I am is found in the in him. So I wanted to kind of just continue to illustrate what does this mean? Okay, okay, so it's a nice big idea, but okay, what does it mean? What does it mean to be in him? I want to share this uh, illustration with this aquarium using these two objects. Um, what I have is I have a rock right here, and I have this small wooden cross, okay? So I have um, th th this rock and, and cross, and they both have kind of separate natures about them, if you will, okay? So little quiz, guys, ready? Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a real rock. Let me just prove it to you, okay? So I'm going to drop the rock inside this aquarium, and I want to ask you, what do y'all think is going to happen to the rock? Okay, y'all said it's going to sink. Let's see what happens. Let's listen. Maybe we can hear it. Okay, it did sink. Right. Okay, good job. So now I'm going to take this wooden cross. It really is wood, and I'm going to put it in the water. I'm going to drop it in the aquarium as well. What do y'all think is going to happen to the wooden cross? Okay, you said it's going to flow. Let's see if you're right. Okay, good job. Okay, so we have two separate things here. We have the rock that sunk, and we have the wooden cross that is afloat. Now, I want to teach you what it means to be in Christ. They both have two separate natures about them. That's why they both did two separate things. Okay, the nature of the rock is such that, you know, when you put it in the water, it, it does what its nature is to do. And the wood, is it, it, its nature is such that when you put it in the water, it's doing what its nature is meant to do. But watch this. When I take the rock, which in this illustration represents us, okay? And when I take this wooden cross, which represents God sticking my hand in the water. That's why I wore a short sleeve shirt in winter, okay? But, <laughs> so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the rock, which represents us, to the cross, representing when we turn our lives over to Christ, the Bible says when we are followers of Christ, we are now, say it, in him. Whether you feel it or not, the Bible says we are in him. Okay? Watch what happens. There's two things that are going to happen. Listen. Either the nature of the rock is going to influence the, the wood, right? And it'll sink. Or the nature of the wood is going to influence the rock, and it will float. Let's see what happens, okay? So the illustration is teaching us that the nature of the wood is more powerful than the nature of the rock when they're connected together, right? And so when it says that we are in Christ, what that means is this, that when we give our lives over to Christ, our names are written in God's book of life in heaven, and we're on our way to heaven someday, but while we're here on earth, we're on this journey, listen to this, listen to this, we're on this journey of daily identification of G of being in Jesus, okay? That means this, even though my name is, is written in heaven and I'm secure and I'm going to heaven someday, how many of you know you can have some really good days and you can really look and act like you're saved, right? How many of you know even when you're a Christian, you can have some days that are kind of ugly and you don't look, act, sound saved, okay? In fact, 
I, your pastor, had one of those days this past week where I had kind of what I'm calling like a mini meltdown for about an hour where something was going on and I got stressed, I got worried, I got afraid, I got a little mad. And you know, we all go through times like that where we are Christ followers, but our life is not looking like it. And you know, that is, listen, listen, that's the time that the enemy wants to come in and say, well, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. You're a sorry Christian. And then we're walking around saying, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I lost my salvation. Maybe God just erased my name out of his book. Maybe I need to get saved all over again. No, you know what we need to do? We need to realize for one hour, what I did was, I didn't turn my back on Jesus. What happened was I chose to identify with the nature of the rock. And I chose to sink instead of going through a turbulent time floating on Jesus, I chose to identify with my old nature and sink. That was my choice. Deb didn't make me do it. The devil didn't make me do it. I chose, I chose, I chose to worry. I chose to fear. I chose to get mad. I chose all those things. It's the truth. Yes, the enemy does have times where he's, he's, the, he's the one. But there's times when we are choosing to unidentify with, watch. I'm not saying we don't love Jesus and we're walking away. But we choose to not identify with his nature. So instead of me worrying, and I sunk because that's my nature, I could have said, I'm not going to worry about this because what I'm learning in Ephesians 1 is that in him, I don't have to worry. In him, I don't have to be afraid. In him, I don't have to get mad about this thing that's in in the light of eternity doesn't even matter. Okay? So church, I'm trying to encourage us today. Okay? That when things happen and our life doesn't look very much like Jesus... Now we can say, maybe it's because I am choosing to identify with the rock and I'm sinking and I need to start identifying with the cross. Amen? Amen? It's good stuff. That's good stuff. So let's real quick go through those four things in your notes and then we have something really cool that we're going to do. So who does God say I am in Ephesians 1? The first one is, if you're taking notes, I am chosen. Remember in verse 4? It said, he chose us in him. You know what this means? Oh my gosh, listen to this. What it means that I am chosen means this. I'm loved, I am wanted, and I belong. Somebody needs to hear that today. Listen, did you ever feel not loved, not wanted? I do. Have you ever felt that? So now what we're learning, when we start feeling The opposite of this, what we're doing is we're identifying with the rock sinking. And we have to say, that's how I feel. But Ephesians 1 is teaching me, in him I am chosen. So the fact is, I'm not unloved, unwanted, and I don't have a place. I am loved, I am wanted, and I do belong. Amen. How about the second one? I am adopted. In verse 5, it said he predestined us for adoption through him. You know what it means to be adopted? It means now, not only does he choose me, but he protects, provides, and cares for me. Like he doesn't just choose you and throw you down at the end of the bench. He chooses you and gives you the first place at the table, providing for you caring. So when you are feeling that you're not protected, you're not provided, and you're, no one cares about you, I have felt that. I have felt like no one gives a rip. Have you felt that ever? Ever in your life? Ever? Okay. Just want to make sure we're, we're tracking. You can say, well, even though I feel that way, that's my, this nature, but in him I am adopted, so I'm this, not the other thing. Okay. How about this next one? I am redeemed. I am redeemed. You know what this Bible word means? We don't use it. 
quite often today, unless you're couponing stuff. Okay, I'm going to redeem this coupon. But what does this mean? Verse 7 says, in him we have redemption. You know what this means? It means I am forgiven, reconciled, and free. The chain, the ball and chain of sin that was wrapped around my ankle, just in him, Jesus breaks it off. Amen? So listen, I'm going to say it until we're going to get it. If I ever feel unforgiven, God doesn't love me, God will never forgive me of that sin. Oh my gosh, I'm bu- in him I am redeemed. Amen? Wait, what's, your, what's that say on your shirt? I am redeemed. There it is right there. He wore the right shirt today and I didn't even call him. Okay. Last one, I am sealed. Verse 13, you are marked in him with a seal. What does that mean, sealed? Well, it means this. I am identified, called, and I am designated. That means if I don't feel like I have a place and that I'm significant and I'm forgotten, we have to know that in Christ, no, I'm sealed. I have an identity in Jesus. You know what this word sealed means? Back in the day, when they, before they had nice envelopes with glue that you lick, okay, whenever they wrote a letter, they would get another piece of paper and fold it, and they would drip wax on it, and they, they, they would have a stamp, boom, and they would stamp it. But there was the identification of who was mailing it, okay, who was sending it, I should say. And man, I'm telling you, that's what Jesus does, man. We are enveloped in him, and he's poured out his love on us, and bam, he just seals us with love, the love of God. Amen? That's a smile break. That should be smile. You're smiling right now. That's good stuff. Okay? Good, good stuff. Well, hey, we're going to close out our time today, and we have a special treat today. I'm going to invite John. John, come on up and join me. Let's give John a hand to the platform. So um, this is John Munoz, and he's been attending our church, he and his family, for about five years or so. And um, he shared a story with me back in December, and I knew that I knew that I knew when this sermon was coming that we, I've got to ask him to share it, okay? So listen, this is what happened. Back in the fall, so even though we've you know, you've been here five years, like we kind of knew each other kind of in passing, but we really didn't connect too much over the past couple years. But in the fall, God really gave us a cool time to connect. And um, I was able to just encourage him with something and he was able to encourage me. And uh, so the youth group had their fall retreat. And, um, you know, hey, I was a youth pastor here and I, I just love the students. So I figured I would go down to the fall retreat just to show that their lead pastor loves them and I'm with them. And, and so when I was there during worship and during the message, they had like some ministry time. And I'm telling you, man, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and, and um, I just felt I had a word for this young man. And uh, so I just went up and um, I'm like, bro, I, I feel like I have a word for you. And I shared that word and um, man, it was just so, so good. And um, the, where this word came from was, um, you know, John um, wrote, wrote the testimony out um, in December and what he was going through. And he, this is the letter that he sent to me. It says, thankfully, I was able to get away from some issues that I was going through for a weekend retreat with my church. While I was there, I dealt with the lies that I was believing, that I was rejected, unwanted, and a failure, and that I wouldn't get anywhere in life. My pastor, this was that time at the altar, my pastor told me I was none of those things and that God has great things planned for me. Those simple words had a profound impact on me. And so I just wanted to ask John to share this story with us today. Check this out. All right, so um, I guess uh, it kind of starts a long time ago when I was a kid. Um, I always had this dream that I wanted to serve in the military. And so um, fast forward to when I was about 17 over the summer last year, um, I uh, went with my mom to the Marine Recruitment Office um, because that's where I wanted to go. And I'm like, how do we get started with this? Let's, Let's do it. I really, this is where I want to be. And um, so we started doing preliminary wake paperwork, and um, from there, uh, we got to the section where they started talking about broken like bones, injuries, and allergies. 
And well, uh, I have, I broke my collarbone in eighth grade, and I also have um, allergies to tree nuts, um, to where I need an, ep an EpiPen uh, and go to the hospital if I ever consume them. Um, so that right there is um, pretty much an immediate disqualification mm -hmm. for uh, the military, if because you know it's a liability to people around you. Um, so that I was really discouraged at that point because. Um, I was entering my senior year in high school, and um, all of a sudden, like, my, my dreams and what I wanted to do were immediately just taken from me. Um, so, and senior year is just the time when everyone around you come up to you, and they're just like, hey, do you know what you're doing? Do you want to know, what, like, do you know what you're doing with your life? Where are you going to go? What are you going to be? And I'm, and I'm like, I'm 18. Like, I, all Pr teenagers. Pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of pressure, and not all teenagers know, like, what they're gonna do, but um, I was there, and um, a lot of my friends, they did know where they mm. wanted to go to college, what they wanted to do, and that really discouraged me, and so for a couple months, I really believed the lies that, like, I was rejected from the military, and that I'm, I'm stupid because I don't know what I wanna mm. do, and it, it was really hard, and so I realized that I needed to get away. Like, I needed to get away from the stress of my hometown, and the retreat came up, and it's actually, it, it was my last retreat that I was able to go on. And if, um, you know, if you're a kid, or if you have a, a son or a daughter or a grandkid that uh, has not gone or has gone on a retreat there, it's an amazing time. It's, it's really uh, good for the soul, and it, it's just so powerful to go to as a kid, because you're with other kids who, like, know what it's like to be with you. Um, so I was there, it was my last time there, and it was the second night, Pastor Mark came up to me, and um, he just, he's like, can I pray for you? I really feel like, like God's calling me to pray for you. I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, I, I would love that, actually. So he did, and, and at that point in life, I just I kind of, like, broke down. And I, I kind of came to the realization where, um, like, I, like I, I'm not rejected. I'm not, Ooh. like, God, like, you know, he believes in me. He has a plan for me. And the scales fell from my eyes, and wow. I was like, you know, God definitely knows what he's doing, and he, he's looking out for me. So I don't, I don't need to be afraid, and I don't need to be upset with myself, and I don't need to believe these lies anymore. Woo! Awesome. Amen. Good stuff. I so appreciate you coming up here and sharing your story because, you know, you're coming, you know, the context is, you know, senior year, what am I... What's God, you know, calling me to do with my life? But, you know, your story resonates with all of us, wherever we're at in life. Because um, I think we're constantly being, bar being bombarded with that fill in the blank. I am, you know, what is this? Because, you know, God gave you a breakthrough, right? And, and what God was teaching you is really giving you tools for the rest of your life. Because um, you're going to you're gonna have future times where, you know, you might have those thoughts. And, but you're going to like, nope, nope. In Christ, I am this. Amen to that? Amen. Good job, man. Well, John, I have, I've asked John to stay up here with me and uh, close out our time today reading the scripture. And I just want to encourage you, church, as we look at who we are. In our Ephesians participant guide on page 13, there's a whole list of statements that define who we are in Christ. Like, we are God's holy people. We are God's children. We are blessed. We are chosen. We are adopted. We are free. We are forgiven. We are loved. We, we are in his will. Um, and we are marked with that seal of the Holy Spirit. I just, I just want to encourage you. Take some time and just, you know, read those slowly this week. And just let, let that truth sink in. And so we're going to end today by reading the rest of Ephesians 1. John's going to read it for us. And this is all about who God is. Check this out. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I have kept asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and the incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in his heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the, this one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head 
over everything in the church, which is his body, the fulfillment of him who fills everything in every way. Wow. That's who God is. And you know what? On page 16 of our participants' guide, it, it maps this out. I want to encourage you to read this slowly this week, too. This is, what, this is what John just read. This is who God is. God is inclusive. God enjoys us. God is our Father. God wants the best for us. God is a forgiver of sin. God lavishes his grace. God works out everything to his purpose. God is our comforter. God is our comforter and helper. God is uh, one of wisdom and revelation. God is our hope. God is our inheritance. God is powerful and God is in control. Amen. That's who God is. Yeah, give God some glory today.